Hi, my name is Daryl Fennessy. I'm a Grammy Award winning vocalist, and I've worked with the likes of Whitney Houston, Lionel Richie, Rod Stewart, and of course, Michael Jackson. This is my interview with Red Jackson. I hope you enjoy. No, I think everybody grew up with Michael Jackson. We went over to Michael's, to Michael's room and hung out with Bubble. And I have this videotape. As a matter of fact, I'll send it to you. Who's rich enough to have Michael Jackson bring this entire thing to their island to put on a, you know, a show for their nephew? And I have overcome fear in my life and have followed through on visualizing and having intentions for things. So before we get to talking about your time with Michael, I want to go back and hear a bit about how you first began in the music industry. So can you tell me a bit about how you discovered your talent for singing? I think when I was, um, I don't know, six, seven, uh, grew up in a Catholic school yeah. and always wanted to be a choir boy, right? Um, but at the same time, choir boy practice happened, which was going to be when I was 12 in the seventh grade. Uh, I mean, altar boy, I, I always wanted to be an altar boy, right? right? But at the same time, altar boy practice was going to happen in um, when I was 12. It was also choir boy practice, so I had to choose right. between the two. Well, obviously, it was going to be choir boy because I love to sing. And so I grew up singing in uh, St. Joseph's um, church as a choir boy. But even before that, I remember being in the congregation and singing along uh, with the hymns and in my head, singing the third above. Uh, I mean, not only in my head, singing the third above everybody, singing the third yeah, below harmonies. everybody, hearing the third in my head and singing the fifth above everybody. You know, and, and I always do that. I always knew that. And of course, when you're a kid, and I'm assuming everybody does that, right? You don't know that you have any particular. Oh, you didn't realize it was a talent. Have. I'm thinking everybody hears harmonies. You know, it's only yeah. later I find out everybody doesn't. So I always heard the harmonies and I always loved the sensation and the feeling and the vibration in my body of making harmony, you know, how that feels and um, just the whole experience of that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I started probably when I was a choir boy in uh, St. Joseph's Church, and I also put uh, little singing groups together in my neighborhood. There's a guy named Charles Clark who I used to see him and a couple of guys singing on the corner. You know, as the cliche goes, uh, actually it was on his front porch, <laughs> and he was about you know ten years old, right? Yeah. So I was I was like uh, nine, and I was like, wow, they're you know those guys are getting together and. Just for fun, they're singing and making harmonies, and I gravitated towards that, and I started doing that. Later, we put a group together. So um, I, ever since I was like probably eight or nine, I've been putting groups together and performing wow. in groups and performing, and you know, and luckily, uh, in East St. Louis, where I'm from, uh, there were talent shows going on all over town at that time. I mean, now I realize in retrospect, wow, what a wonderful not phenomenon that was, an outlet for talent, right? Yeah. So we would practice. I mean, our group would practice like, I don't know, three, four hours a day, like between at five and seven. At that age as well? But yes, between five and wow. seven days a week. I mean, we go after school directly to uh, this woman who lived down the street from me. Her name was LaDonna Mitchell. And she let us, you know, she was like about four years older than us. But her parents, uh, they were like a musical family. So they allowed these like 12, 13 year olds to be over their house, you know, practicing uh, dance routines and singing and yeah. working out harmonies. And yeah, wow. so I had extensive like uh -huh. just background of like just rehearsing, rehearsing, rehearsing. So, of course, when we went to do those talent shows, it was like falling off a log you know we like we did it every day so by the time we get to do it in front of people well that now you get to do the same thing you've been doing in that living room but now people are enjoying it like no nervousness no yeah. and later i went to find out that's how you know in the music industry like the best people do that like for before yeah. we go out on tour with michael we might rehearse for two months yeah. you know by the time we go to do the first show we know that show like it's a play you know, yeah, like so it just sort of comes naturally to you then. It's yeah, just a matter of yeah. doing it. Yeah, you're just ex you're executing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So 
that led on to you getting a deal with Quincy Jones, right? And that sort of connected you to Michael Jackson. Yeah. Wow. Look at you. The first time that I worked with Michael was literally what? Not even a mile from my house at Evergreen Studios. As a matter of fact, I rode my bike to the session that day. Uh, Quincy had put it together for Michael uh, to have myself and three other singers, uh, David Swanson, Kevin Dorsey, and Saida Garrett. We were there to be the voices of the Cretans. Those are like these giant tree animals or entities that were on the Victory Tour. So that's the first time I met Michael. Michael was producing that vocal session, you know, having us sing as the Cretans. It was pretty for real, you know, surreal seeing. It's like somebody you've heard of all your life and you've seen, you know, you've seen, you've seen the magazines, you've seen on television, and all of a sudden you walk in the room and that real person is there. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's pretty for real, uh, surreal, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and he's just, he's a sweet guy. He's a humble guy. And he, he knows what he wants. You know, he's absolutely sure about what he wants. And, but he's very uh, appreciative, you know, right from the beginning. He's like, you know, he's appreciative when, you, when you're doing your work, you know, and lets you know that, you know. Yeah. And uh, so it was really a pleasant, um, pleasant working with him for the first time. I mean, at that time, I had been doing a lot of recording sessions. I mean, I was one of the top session singers in town, you know, so. Yeah. I've done a lot of, re you know, sessions, but, you know, coming there doing Michael was, of course, another session, but, but also yeah. it was like with this Pretty guy cool. who's like, wow, you know. Yeah. So, icon. yeah. Had, had you sort of been following Michael's work since the Jackson 5? Did you sort of grow up with that? Or were you sort of more distanced from Michael's work? No, no, I think everybody grew up with Michael Jackson. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody in my, you, you, because he's like a pop icon. So you, you couldn't dodge growing up with Michael Jackson, you know? Yeah. And in my case, you know, I love the Jackson five. Uh, as a matter of fact, our group, uh, that group that I was just explaining to you that did the, uh, the talent shows, I sang Jermaine's part, you know, talk about telegraphing to the future. I sang, a Jermaine song called uh, I Found That Girl. You know, that was one of my, you know, songs that I yeah. did as the lead singer of that group that, you know, got me a lot of acclaim, you know, and a lot. So, yeah, I, I love the Jackson 5. And I know okay. I knew them from uh, their first recording was Big Boy. You know, right. I'm a big boy now, right, before Motown. And I, you know, we knew that because I'm, in, I'm from Illinois and they're from Indiana. So it's local to me. So I knew about yeah. them from Big Boy and loved that. Right. Yeah, yeah, so like since the beginning, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, so cool about how that sort of led to, you know, you collaborating with him for so many years. Yeah. So let's skip to the bad tour. What qualities was Michael looking for, you know, with the backing vocalists, whether that's sort of musically or within work ethic? Did you all sort of have similar qualities you brought to the table or did everyone have sort of different attributes? So when you put, you know, everyone together, you excelled. It's interesting. I'll tell you the story. Michael put out an audition that was from a, the reason I got called for the audition because I was one of the top session singers in Los Angeles. And so other people of that ilk were called. There are people from New York, there are people from different parts around, you know, from the country who for, for varying reasons were called to audition. And yeah. so uh, myself and three other people, and they just kind of put us together as a group randomly kind of to audition for Michael. So I recorded with, I, I did my audition with three other people. Uh, Greg Phil and Gaines was a band leader. So we came in to audition with the band playing there which I thought the band was playing too loud. I'll be obvious, you know, I'm a singer. And so yeah. I have singer sensibilities different than a musician's sensibilities. They want to hear themselves. But the point is, mm -hmm. this is about Michael here in the backgrounds. Yeah, so I thought audition. they were playing too loud. And he, and, he, and he chose two or three songs for us to sing together. One of the girls, I can't think of her name. She was kind of had like a, she was very exotic looking, kind of like Hawaiian, black mixture. Uh, and she had like a, uh, a musicals background, you know, so because she so she could sing, but she couldn't sing harmonies. 
you know, mm. but they were picking her for her look, not really kind of right. knowing the ins and outs of singing, right? Yeah. Anyway, and a couple of other guys, one that I had done sessions with, and another one who was new, who was kind of nervous. So when we did our audition, I did, I mean, again, I at that point, I was at the top of my game doing that. So it's like, I'm going, oh my God, I'm getting an audition for Michael. And it's like, they put me with a group of folks. With those, and, yeah. We're not gelling. It's like, I'm thinking, oh, wow, really? You know? Mm. So anyway, afterwards, Nelson Hayes, who was the... Uh, assistant uh, tour uh, assistant tour manager who was, you know, uh, videoing it. He said, okay, afterwards, he says, Michael wants to put you guys on hold. You know, he said, he said, we want to put you on hold. Uh, he was filming the things and then later taking them to Michael. Okay. You know, like he was filming him and then like maybe two, three hours later, he take them to Michael. So anyway, he had called me and said, Michael wants to put you guys on hold, which I was surprised, right? Also, at the same time, for me, I auditioned for the Dolly Parton show. It was going to be like a yeah. variety show that the four singers were going to get to act. We're going to be on primetime television. We get to do skits with her. We get to sing with her. I mean, another big like, opportunity. Wonderful opportunity, right? They all, yeah. all this is coming. Why couldn't that come six months before, right? All of this is coming at one time. So I had put together, a friend of mine called me for that who was already on that gig and on the he called me and I put together, I had the four of us, myself, uh, someone else who I got, I got Kevin Dorsey, and he already had two other guys. I taught them this song, Jukebox Saturday Night, which is like a 40s song that um, I think the Glenn Miller band made popular. Uh, and I taught that okay. to them and we got that audition for Dolly Parton and they wanted us to be on the show. This is the same week of Michael's thing, right? The next right. day I, you know, audition for Michael. So when Nelson told me he wanted to put us on hold, I was like, ah, I said, Nelson, yeah. I don't want to be rude and I'm not trying to be pushy, but I've auditioned for the Dolly Parton show and already got that, but I'd rather go on tour with Michael. Can you tell me what, you know, he, you say he's putting on hold, us on hold. What, what, he, what's going on with that? He said, ah, he said, you know what? You should take that gig. Cause Michael, Michael's not sure what he wants, or, or I put it this way. It's not that he isn't sure what he wants. He wants a group like the Modern Heirs, who was uh, Elvis Presley's Elvis, yeah. uh, backup group, right? And I mean, at this point, I'm kind of racking my brain because these two excellent opportunities. And I'm thinking yeah. to myself, uh, you know what? Here's a here's I want to impart this information to Nelson because it's just kind of a burning thing that singers want to do. Or it's like musicians or producers don't necessarily know the idiosyncrasies and ins and outs of singers, right? Yeah. So I told him, I said, Nelson, why doesn't he get like the Waters? You know, that's a group that's, you know, he has have worked with him before. He said, yeah. well, he just wants somebody younger, you know, younger look. I said, okay. And I was about to hang up the phone and just, well, you know, thanks for letting me know. And, and then I just, I wanted to just impart this information. Like, a, you know, like, Nelson, it's not that he wants singers that have been singing together because if I put four people together, you're going to think we've been singing together forever because I'm going to pick people who know how to sing together. Because I just, I just had a burning need to say, why don't you know that? Right. Yeah. Right? You and had he the said, balls to say that. Yeah. Right. So he went, well, why don't you do that? Oh, I went, okay. So, and I wasn't doing it for that reason. I was just, was just doing it. Like just I just needed it. to purge that. Right. Yeah. So I then called Kevin Dorsey again, Cheryl Crow, and Dorian Holly, brought them over to my house, taught them that song, Jukebox Saturday Night, that 40s song. Yeah. Uh, and then we did excerpts of Michael, about five of Michael's songs Off the Wall, Beat It. Um, let's see. Uh, Thriller. Uh, songs that would show like the diversity of his kind of music that would show that the eclectic nature of his, they would cover that. Right. Okay. So, and I said, I, I taught them those, I, we, we rehearsed those songs and we went over to the rehearsal studio. I said, Nelson, no band, just have us in the, in the rehearsal room, just in a, you know, like in, in a, like a small rehearsal room. It's like soundproof. 
put the camera on us and just let us sing. No microphones, no nothing. Just let us sing in the room, right? And that's how we had rehearsed it. So we introduced ourselves. And, and I have this videotape. As a matter of fact, I'll send it to you because you're, you're interested, did. Michael. I'll yeah. send you that audition. Thanks so, so much, yeah. We introduced ourselves and we started off with Jukebox Saturday Night. Okay, Daryl. Hi, Mike. I'm Daryl Fennessy. Dorian Holly. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. I'm Cheryl Crow. Hi, Mike. I'm Kevin Dorsey. Jukebox Saturday Night. One, two, three. Mop it up, soda pop, Ricky's. To our heart's delight, dancing to swing a little quickies, jukebox Saturday night. Goodman and Kaiser and Miller help to make things bright. Mixing hot licks with vanilla, jukebox Saturday night. They put nothing past us, me and Honey Lamb, making one coat last us till it's time to scram. Miller helped you make things right. Mixing hot licks with vanilla. Jukebox Saturday night. All right. It's like a closed chord harmony song. It's like a 40s. Uh, it's like the kind of song that all singers can't sing. It's only a certain level of singers can, you know, hear okay. those kind of harmonies and stuff. Yeah. And I said, I know that Michael will appreciate. First of all, he's eclectic in his choice of things. And I picked this song, right? That's a 40s song, something. So we sang that song first, and then we did the excerpts of the other songs, all a cappella. Because I knew that I've been a musical direct. I mean, I've been like the I, we, I, we weren't calling it that when I was kids, but I've always been like the musical director of groups that I've been in. And that's yeah. what I would know that I would like to hear to know that people knew it. So I said, yeah. this is going to show him. Well, yeah. Nelson made that tape, took it to Michael, and called me about you know a couple hours later. He says, when Michael heard like, 15, 20 seconds of Jukebox Saturday night, he said, these are the guys. Before he even wow. heard his own stuff. Yeah. I mean, that just shows how sort of having the confidence to just say something or do something, you know, that sort of changed your life forever. Mm, yeah, yeah. Wow. And the, the three other singers must be, you know, so grateful to you, you know, mm. for doing that and for giving them that opportunity. I'm, I'm sure they are. I'm sure they That's are. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. So, how did MJ sort of give feedback and work with the vocalists? Whether that's your recreations of his vocals in the songs, or whether that's your personal solos with I'll Be There and Black or White? So, basically, um, wow, Michael never, um, let me see, I'm trying to think for Black or White or I'll Be There. I mean, basically, the same kind of uh, direction that he would give, that he gave to anybody doing something solo. He's always more, big, bigger, you know. You know, Michael has no worry about you outshining him. If anything, right. he wants you to go as big and to shine in your moment. And that's kind of his encouragement, you know. Not many artists would do that. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, think about who he is. Who's going to upstage Michael, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and he just he gets it you know he, he wants everyone to be their best and that makes the show the best yeah. i remember uh one epiphany for me was he came over when we were doing uh he didn't have very much you know things to say because uh, because i've done this ever since i was a kid learned uh uh, learned the vocals and list by listening to records and, and hearing the intricacies and teaching so I mean, we had his vocals like 95% accurate, right? And it's funny, what he came over and commented on was was very interesting to me. Uh, it was uh, Billy Jean. He was like, so so for Billy Jean, I want you guys to go. I want to get the breaths. He says, Billy Jean is not my lover. I'm the bit. Like he was specific about not my lover. Yeah. That sort of rhythm in it. I went, oh my God, he's like a Bobby McFerrin. I had never thought of him in that way, right? The, yeah. That like, 
the intricacies that he's hearing, mm -hmm. you know. So we were we had the notes right and we had the, the rhythm right, but he he wanted this extra percussive thing within our yeah. vocals that was unique to his sound. And I yeah. was like, wow. I mean, even like duh, uh, he wanted that as specific yeah. as everything else. And I was like, wow, I love this guy. <laughs> yeah, so much detail, like even between the notes, the little, little yeah. sounds. So he, he could hear everything. So is it right in saying, you know, when he was performing or rehearsing, he sort of was in full control and he was hearing every little sound? Oh, for sure. I mean, because one, he's singing all of those vocals on his records. And I don't know if you've seen videos of, and, and if not, you should go back and find them. There are videos where he's singing whole songs, like imitating the instruments, you know? Yeah. Show what the instrument part that's what he wants the guitar to be doing, yeah, you know. And but for horns, I mean, he's doing those kind of things. Obviously, he has arrangers that are like adding on to that or doing different things. But the heart of the songs, he has many of in the his things in his arrangement that he's done as vocals, you yeah. know. So, yeah, he definitely is hearing all of them. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, this is so, so cool and just shows, you know, sort of the extent of his artistry. Yeah. Wow. I think one of the things unique about him um, is he's the writer of the song. So he's the dancer that's interpreting a song by a writer. He's the singer that's interpreting the song by a writer, but he's the singer that sings the way that he wants to present that song. He's the dancer yeah. that he's writing a song that he knows he wants to present visually in a certain way. So all of those things are working yeah. together at the same time, right? Yeah. So he's like the dancers, dancers, the singer, singer, you know, the thing when, what I think Michael will be remembered as, he is the consummate entertainer. That is his art. It's not just singer, just dancer, just writer, just recording art. He is an entertainer. That's what he has mastered the art of presenting a show to yeah. you, presenting a show to you. That That is his genius, you know? Mm -hmm. And in, in telling the story and then visually and sonically presenting that story to mm -hmm. you. You know, to the nth exactly. degree. I mean, he studied the greats. You know, and he's a You know, he's a compilation of. I mean, he's James Brown. He's Jackie Wilson. He's Marcel Marceau. He's uh, wow. He's Thomas Edison. He's yeah. you know. I mean, he's all of those things combined to create his vision. You know, he's yeah. he's. Charlie Chaplin, you know, I mean, he studied all of those people to the nth degree, you know, mm. and people say things like that. I understand things like that because literally from time I was like 11 or 12, I rehearsed for three, four hours a day. I know what that feels like. Later, when yeah. I went to college to study music, I'm in the rehearsal room, you know, uh, you know, three, four hours. I know what it feels like to want something like that and to put that kind of energy and focus and what it, you know, how, that's why by the time I moved out to Los Angeles, I wasn't nervous about any auditions or doing any no. sessions with anybody or performing with anybody. You'd had you know? that experience. Yeah. 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 And I mean, now multiply that by what? For Michael, five years yeah. old, he's been like a superstar since he's five, six years old. Mm -hmm. You know, so he knows that world, loves that world. I mean, that's the difference in, say, a Frank Sinatra and a Michael Jackson. You know, Michael Jackson is the consummate performer when he's 10 years old. Yeah. You know, Frank Sinatra is a consummate performer. Sammy Davis Jr., consummate performer. But Michael Jackson is that from 10 years old. From 10, yeah. But what is he when he gets to be 18? What does he get? To, what is it when he gets to be 20? You know? Yeah. yeah. It's a really, really interesting way, you know, of putting that. Never thought of it that mm -hmm. way, but mm -hmm. wow. So... You stayed on for all the tours, Bad, Dangerous, and History, and then you went on to This Is It in 2009. 
So, mm -hmm. over that time period, do you have any insight as to how Michael's voice changed? Was it sort of the same, or, you know, did things vary a little bit, you know, as he got older? Well, I think all, all of our voices change as we get older. I think his style and way of presenting himself, you know, changed more than right. anything else. I, it's, it's that more than just to say his voice, right? His, joy, his voice mm -hmm. is just ex, an external externalization of that. But the way he wanted to present himself and how he wanted to tell stories changed. So yeah. his characters changed. That's the way okay. that I see. Because I approach, music, I approach music that way as a singer. I see a song as a script and I'm a character. Yeah. So either, however the song is written, either, either I'm narrating the story or I'm telling the story from the first, you know, from the first person point of view, you know, and I think my, Michael does the same thing. It's like a script and he becomes that character and he embodies yeah. that storytelling, which then is going to come out in singing different ways according to different songs. You know? Yeah, I get what you mean. So, out of those three world tours, Bad Dangerous History, which would you say was the best, whether we're talking, you know, artistically and the fans, you know, sort of response? So for like Michael's sort of progression of his artist artistry, not your favorite, but which would you say is the best? Well, it's it's hard to separate myself from that because yeah. the first tour is the best because it's the first. Yeah, do you know what I mean? It's like being it's like seeing the Matrix, right? Mm. Or some movie that has like a a, a a switch ending at the end, right? The first time. Did you do you know the movie The Matrix and do you like the I movie do. The Matrix? I do, I do. So the first, first Matrix is the best because now yeah. you're being introduced to the entire world of the Matrix, which is a yeah. very unique and different story. After that, you know the Matrix and now you're going further into it. But to go from no Matrix to Matrix is the best, right? Yeah. So to go from no Michael to performing with Michael, that's the best. Yeah. Best. Big Reap fan. Yeah. So after that. What it is for me is, is I saw the progression of his artistry. Uh, I remember thinking on history, wow, Michael's writing most of the songs now. And it's become one of these albums where like a Stevie Wonder album would be like that to me. Or a Prince album where I want to put the record, I want to, well, we say put the needle down. There's no such thing now, right? <laughs> I want to start the song from the beginning and just listen song after song after song at the progression of it. I found myself by the time Michael got to the history album, I wanted to listen to his album like that. Yeah. Listen okay. to his storytelling. So I thought his storytelling had matured and he had matured as an artist in expressing himself individually, not just being a phenomenal performer and entertainer, but telling his story, his yeah. personal story as a performer and entertainer. And I think his audience grew with that and loved him more and more for that because he's always going to be this whatever Michael shows up on stage whatever he does it's like right it's like the certain yeah. actors right they can read the phone book right Lawrence yeah. Olivier can read the phone book and he's interesting you know <laughs> Michael Caine yeah you know so Mike but then to find to have a Michael Jackson now telling his personal story to you you know, not yeah. interpreting other people's things, but talking about they don't really care about us, you know, and mm -hmm. scream, you know, it's, it's stuff yeah. makes me want to scream at the media. It's like, that's a level of excitement about yeah. it. It's more personal you as well. Know, and that's what we love about the artists that we really love. We get kind of a bit of insight of who, who they are, you know? Yeah. I like that. That makes sense. So do you think This Is It would have been, you know, even better again? Oh, Yes, I do. Yeah. I do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I was already seeing it shape up. First of all, one of the things that Michael has always done is he's on the cutting edge of technology and bringing something new, right? Yeah. I remember standing in the auditorium uh, about, I don't know, 75 yards from the stage, uh, which we said we'll say 75 meters from the stage, and we were checking out this effect where uh, Michael was going to be in a, uh, there's going to be a video going on and then Michael was going to jump out of the video onto the stage. I think it was a uh, smooth criminal. 
Right. And yeah. so they were kind of showing us what the 3D effect of that was going to look like. So again, I'm standing like out in the auditorium about 75 meters from the stage. And I could see like just to the left or the right of me, according to how I kind of cut my eyes, it was like Michael jumping out of the video and onto the stage was like, he was like three feet away from me. Yeah. You know, I had, and that, I had not seen that innovation in 3D, you know, projection, you know. So, I mean, that's just one, that's just one small aspect. You know, Michael's shows aren't about all of that. Michael's shows are about watching Michael, right? But mm-hmm. he adds these other things, you know. So, and also it was more and more, again, his personal message, you yeah. know. Of, and it, And this time it was about healing the world and the environment and, you know. So, yeah, I think it was going to be, whenever I would tell people about coming to, whenever I invite someone to come to a show when I was on tour, I would always say, you know, I don't care how much I tell you or how many videos you watch, it's still not enough. When you get here, it's going to be something that is big, so much bigger than what I'm telling you right now, what you've seen on the screen. Yeah, you've got to be like yourself. Yeah, I mean, to actually see someone physically in front of you doing that thing and all of the things happening is, yeah. Remarkable. It's yeah. genius, you know? And that was his talent. Mm-hmm. Certainly. Yeah. I mean, he can physically do things that people, you know, that a lot of people can't do. I mean, he's, you know, he's an exemplary human being, you know, yeah. in his, his body and his, you know, his voice and, you know, he's just, his understanding of how to present that is, that's yeah. really his genius, you know? So you performed the Royal Brunei show in 1996. Do you remember anything sort of notable about that and how it differed from the other concerts? Well, I mean, as far as the presentation of the concerts, we're doing the same thing. You know, we're, we're delivering that because we're bringing everything uh, you know, the stage and every, literally we could put Michael's show up and did put it up in like a farmer's field, right? In Austria, yeah. you know what I mean? Because, you know, 15 uh, semi trucks pull up and they've got everything from the electricity, yeah. the stage to everything. So in, in that sense, you know, we're in control of the lighting. and That's another thing that, you know, the tours on that level understand that. And so you're in control of, what your you know uh, presentation is going to be. So in that sense, yeah. that's the same. What was unique was that this guy who's like you know Todd is the richest guy in the world <laughs> is putting on a Michael Jackson concert for his like nephew's birthday party. You know, and to do so had built all of the surrounding accoutrements to our stage setup, like the backstage stuff and all of where we, you know, where, where the entertainers, you know, hang out backstage and the whole around. So everything was that. Right. I mean, built that also built an amusement park for this event, you know, that then would go on to be an amusement park after that. But so he like built this amusement park, you know, we put on the show. Uh, I mean, and there were things like, this is when I kind of, you know, you get the, it's almost like reading a fairy tale to me, right? Yeah. It's like you hear about these sheiks and these, you know, these sultans, right? The, the what would normally be the, uh, what do you call it? Wrought iron fence around something. Yeah. In this case, that fence was gold. It's like it's like it's so much opulence and so much money that people have to tell you about the things that they spent money on because you would never even who would even think to look at a fence, right? This fence yeah. was gold, so it was stuff like that, you know. Oh my gosh. Um, so just kind of uh, finding out, like, wow, this is what you know, rich beyond what I. Who, who's rich enough to have Michael Jackson bring this entire thing to their island? To put on a you know a show for their nephew you know so <laughs> insane you know it's hard to fathom that like that happened yeah and I mean a lot of uh, a lot of my friends uh, who have been there you know like with Lionel Richie or been there with other performers or uh, 
you know, talk about how, you know, all the performers got Rolex watches, or they got this or that other thing, right? Or they got hired to come back and, and be the tutor for the Sultan's nephew for a week and they're making, you know, $10,000 a day, you know, stuff like that. So we didn't get any Rolex watches. I don't, we, so we didn't get any of those kind of perks. Unfortunately. Uh, who knows why? Yeah. 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 <laughs> In another life, I think one perhaps. of them. I think one of them. Yeah, you're right. I think one of the impressions it left me with was, I mean, wow, this is what rich is like. Once you, once you get so rich, the things that show your richness are so like unknown, not natural that you have to tell people that oh. That's a solid gold toilet, or that's a like. So what's the value of that? You know. So it's kind of yeah. It took an edge off of it for me. You know. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, How, you know, it's so. It, it just seems so sort of far away and so distant to you know. Everything else. <laughs> well, I mean, what you, I mean, you know, so unique experience. Yeah. 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 Wow, and so. Let's skip back to this is it. So was that whole comeback sort of hinted at or built towards amongst the whole MJ team? Or did that come as like a total surprise to you? You know, how did you find out about it? I mean, it was a surprise to me when it came up. Um, mm -hmm. So no, if, if there, I, I, I'm sure there were people in the know that knew about it, you know, coming yeah. together before I did, but, uh, from the time I knew it was definitely happening and I was, you know, uh, being groomed to be a part of it. Yeah. So, yeah. So from the time I knew it was on and I was being hired, you know, actually we auditioned like Dorian, like Dorian was the one that called me to audition. Right. You had to audition, you know, because there's a new, um, musical director. Right. Um, uh, and, he had worked with Dorian on, um, what is it? Uh, American Idol and other yeah. shows like that. So he got Dorian, he told Dorian to get the singers, right? And then, so we put the singers together. I guess it was like a formality. We went and uh, did our audition just in the room. And this is again, now this is going back to being influenced by the way that I had done the first you know, audition, uh, just in the room with Michael you know, and uh, we had like a boom box that was playing some of, you know, the, the, some of the music and we we're singing along. And I said to Dorian, why don't we just do it a cappella? You know, you just like old times. Exactly. So, <laughs> so Michael was right there. I, I remember coming into the, uh, the sound stage and uh, Michael seeing me and coming up and giving me a hug, you know, that was, that felt good after all of that time, you know, please. Yeah. Got big life and doing a lot of things. Who knows, right? Was that the first time you'd seen him since the history tour? Uh, you mean since the, the the tours before? Yeah. Oh, right, right. Since the history tour. Yes, yes, it was. It was. Wow. So a yeah. lot of time had passed Physically. there. Yeah. Huh? A lot of time had passed there. So it was oh, sort yeah. of like reuniting. Yeah. So it was really... And I could see... Um, it's funny... You know, whatever you're doing in your life, you know, we as human beings, in, we tend to kind of like, I don't care how big something is or how phenomenal it is, it just becomes regular to you. You know, it becomes normal to you, whatever your yeah. normal is. Right? So to me, I, I always thought being on tour with Michael, it's like, you know, yeah, I, the tour is about Michael Jackson. I, there's 16 of us up here on the stage, but we could, you know, some other singer here, nobody's going to leave the audience if it weren't me. You know what I mean? And so I kind of never really, I, I know what, you know, I know what I bring to it. And I know, you know, that I'm excellent at what I do. But it's not like if I weren't on stage, anybody's going to not come to the show. Right. right. So I just kind of thought, okay, I'm here and I'm doing my job and I'm a part of the show. And I never really took it in until this is it. Uh, when yeah. I saw Michael and he hugged me that day, um, and I saw it in his eyes, you know, it's like he was glad, you know, you know, to, to be with that, that it was me and he was familiar with me and he knows what I do. Yeah. 
And then it kind of made sense to me. And of course, it's like Michael always chooses. He is very particular about who he's choosing, you know, to, to yeah. represent him and to be a part of his thing. And I felt special about it for the first time, strangely. You know, I felt, yeah. wow. Yeah, sort of honored I really in a am sense. special to him and to, to this show and helping him to birth his, you know, his ideas and his presentation. Hmm. And it's not like he didn't, he didn't give me any reason not to feel that before. It was just my own, yeah. you know, I don't have yeah. such, so much ego. I'm going, yeah, I'm making Michael Jackson tour be a special thing, you know. But I hey. felt it in our rehearsals, you know, for This Is It. Hmm. You know, I felt supportive of Michael and that he really, it meant something that the ones that were, of us that were there, that had always been there, there was a special um, chemistry between us, you yeah. know? Yeah. Definitely. So... How much would you say This Is It was like, you know, all the old crew sort of reuniting for one last concert? Or was it more just like starting something new? A bit of both. Uh, definitely something new because Michael's mm. is always creating something new. You know, there are the things that you're familiar with, but now there's a twist on it, you know, yeah. that's making it new again, you know? Mm -hmm. So... And there's, you know, so day by day, right? If you watch the movie, this is it. It's like day by day, it's like, oh. First, it's like the dancers are, are acting like they're coming out of the toasters, right? We call them the toasters, the thing that they yeah. pop up, pop up, pop up yeah. from under the stage, like these elevators, right? These accelerated elevators. First, it's like they're just crouching down and jumping up. There are no toasters, right? And then the next day you come, the toasters are there, right? Yeah. Uh, one day they're walking around with, uh, you know, a stick, you know, with the cardboard uh, cut out on it. Right. And in two days now, now the next day, it's like, oh, it's the freaking spider. Right. This is giant. Oh, spider yeah, yeah, yeah. On the other side. So, you know, it's like all of that stuff is keeping things it developing. Yeah. 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 And it's like, you know, then the one day you come and it's like, oh. He's going to be jumping out of the video onto the stage. And like I said, the thing I was talking about earlier where they had a stand like, you know, I was like three quarters of the length of a football field away from the stage. And I see the 3D image of Michael, like he's like three feet away yeah. from me. It's like, yeah. I had never, I, I hadn't seen any video innovations like that, like any 3D yeah. innovations like that. So yeah, those things are constantly reminding you, oh yeah, as, as, as Cutting edge. much of a, yes. I'm sorry, what yeah. word did you just say? Cutting edge. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, obviously this is it didn't eventually come to fruition. But how did you feel about the This Is It documentary film being released? Do you think Michael would have wanted, you know, people to see his concert in that unfinished form? Huh. Ultimately, yes. Yeah. For, it's funny. I've never thought about it in that way. The way I thought about it is, wow, what a great gift to his fans. I mean, to me, it's the most exciting way to see it. It's like I'm more interested in that than I am in the show. Who gets to see that? Right. Yeah. The whole so behind the scenes kind of, aspect. I think the kind of imagination that Michael has short of it being the show, I think he would love for it to be a documentary about, you know, because it was it's, it's because of Michael that all that stuff is being recorded anyway. Yeah. It's his idea that we he he's he's got footage of all of our rehearsal stuff from the very first tours, you know. Yeah. I mean that's why there's a tour that's why I can send you that video of that audition. You know what yeah. I mean? Michael's got because I remember standing under the stage one day and Michael came over and it was just the singers. I think it was like maybe Dorian and myself. And and um, we were taking a break and he was saying, the reason I film everything, he said, I want to film everything because I don't want anyone to ever be able to say that this didn't happen. You know? Because, you yeah. know, different pieces of history have been erased. You yeah. know? And so he says, I'm going to document all of this 
you know. So it's because of Michael's, you know, the way he thinks that this is it was recorded anyway. So yes, I guess the answer ultimately would absolutely, I think he would love that. Because it shows his fans a part of a side of him, like like most of his fans doesn't know that Michael is coming up with all of those, you know, the large majority of those ideas, and is in yeah. on the execution of you know this this little detail or that little detail. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I think you know it's really important for the fans to see sort of the other side of things because there's not much out there like that. You know, it's cool to see Michael in the process of creating. So you tell me, because I'm an entertainer, yeah, you know, and I know the back, you know, the backstory, you know, the what we do in the background. To me, it is just ultimately fascinating to see that. That that's like yeah. that's the best. I'd rather see that than a concert. Right. Yeah. Now that's me speaking from you know from this side of it. So I'm interested. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I think. I see both sides, of course, but yeah. yeah, I do like to see, you know, the whole process of creating, you know, what goes into it, how it developed, you know, seeing all those clips of Michael and how he sort of worked with his team. I think that just gives us as fans a broader idea of who he was and how, you know, how he did what he did and his sort of genius yeah, I mean, I would have loved to seen Rembrandt painting Whistler's mother. You know what I mean? Not just to finish that, I would have loved to be in that room and watch a fly on, and watch how he was layering it and what, you know, and what he was thinking. And yeah, yeah. to me, wow. Yeah, that's, that's what right. I think it is, you know? That's fair enough. And so, obviously, you toured with Michael, you know, on all of the world tours, and he went all over the world. And so, do any particular countries stand out to you for being, you know, perhaps unique or having interesting audiences or maybe even being particularly intimidating or anything like that? Well, because of my personality, my personality is, I, I, I'm eclectic, right? I draw from a bunch of sources and things. So, yeah, to me, it's... The juxtaposition of, of having come from Marbella, Spain, you know, on the um, the uh, the Spanish Riviera to the next day being in Moscow and it's cold, you know, it's like yeah. it's just the juxtaposition of coming from one culture to the other culture, to different food, to different attitudes. It's that that is exciting to me, the, the, the change from one to the other to the other and appreciating yeah. each thing for what it is. And just it's like a kid, just like a toddler, just being in wonder yeah. and not judging what I'm seeing, but just being in wonder, oh, wow, that's how they do that here. That's how they do that here. You know, like Japanese audiences, they sit, they don't jump up and they don't, you know, but, but they, they, after the concert is finished, they file out, they're calling out the order of the row and they're leaving in order and stuff. But they're absolutely fanatical about Michael. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just to see how different cultures show that, you know. Mm. Um, so it's the differences that that are interesting to me. Not any any you know specific. I can't. Specific oh, ones, of course, yeah. I love Paris, but I love Moscow. I love uh, Tokyo. It all for different reasons, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair enough. Yeah, that whole sort of diversity aspect of it. Yeah. And that's my personality. Somebody else is going to tell you, oh, my God, I love being in Paris. You know, I, for me, it was, I'm just taking yeah. it all in and going, wow, and that's what they do here, and that's what they eat here, and wow, look, give me one of those. You know, how are you eating yeah. that? What do you put on that? You know, that's so, what I love. Let's say you went back and sort of relived all those tours with Michael. Is there anything you would have done differently at all? Huh. Uh, you know what? I can start to, you know, we always have like this perfect plan in our head of what we plan to do, right? And then life happens yeah. and it's different. Than and I think yeah. what I've come to appreciate is anything that I would have changed would make my life, you know, watching those like um, time travel movies, right? Yeah. Would make my life different right now. 
I love yeah. my life right now. You know, I love meeting you and you're interviewing me right now. I love that this is my reality. And so yeah. all of it had to be the way it was, mm -hmm. you know, to bring all of this about, you know? Yeah. You know, my relationships with my friends and with my kids and grandkids and all of that is because of the way that it happened. So you know what? The way that it happens is larger than I could plan or imagine. And I like it that way, you know? Yeah, I think that's a really sort so, of no, good way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't change anything. Yeah. When, when you think of Michael, does a particular memory or a particular anecdote just come to mind? I, I was telling you about it a little earlier. We were underneath the steps on stage. I think it was Dorian and myself. And when he was explaining of why he was taping the tour, you know, why he was taping rehearsals, but he was also talking about just camera work in, in, in general. And he was saying about like Motown 25, when he first did the moonwalk, when he said that he was making the choice, he was telling us how, because you as the entertainer, you know what you, what your strong points are and what you want to spotlight, right? I'm yeah. elaborating on what he said, but in my own words, but it was Michael that said, okay, and when I, when I do this, I want the shot to be on my feet, right? And I'm wearing these socks, right? Because right. that's going to highlight what I'm doing, right? It's like, you know, they joke about Michael wearing his, we call them high water pants, right? Like pants that are too short, right? And then yeah. you can see the socks. But that's because, that's for Michael, that's because so the person at the back of the stadium can see his feet, can see what his feet and legs are doing, right? Yeah. And so Michael's like, he says he was making the choices. He was saying that it's like, you know, I forget exactly his words, but basically he was saying, I was telling them, okay, on that point, I want you to shoot my feet, right? And then I want you to shoot right after I do the moonwalk, when I do a certain part, piece of moonwalk, I want you to then shoot the reaction. I want to have cameras to shoot the reaction of some people in the audience to that. So, so he was like, like a filmmaker. Wow, this, this kind of really informed me about it's just how he's seeing the whole picture of it, right? Mm. Not just how he's presenting it, but how he wants it to be shot to present it. You know what I mean? How elaborate that his mind was in seeing that, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, that like, again, when, like when he came over and showed us that thing on Billie Jean, <laughs> that kind of like, whoa, wow, he's hearing yeah. the vocals. And Cause I do that. I sing, like when I write songs, I can I can play keyboard, but I do it better with my voice. I'll sing the part of horns. I'll sing the part of the drums. I'll sing the part of so I completely appreciate hearing that he's doing that, right? Yeah. So I was like, wow, I didn't know that he did that. And when he came over and showed us that, that was like, wow, that was an epiphany for me. And then yeah. when he was talking to us under the stage about uh, Motown 25 and the whole idea of recording what what's going on so that it won't be lost to history and recording it from your own point of view. So you're helping to tell your own history, which then later, right. Then he comes out with, you know, his tour is called history and his album is called history. So it's all kind of yeah. saying his, you know, how he's taking all of that in his impact as well. Yeah. yeah. So he, you know, it's so interesting to hear how he had that vision and how he just sort of controlled everything, even where the mm. cameras were like a filmmaker that that's, so, you know, so it, cool, and it shows, you know, the extent to which, you know, how far he went. You know, it also is, is kind of revealing to show, you know, how far you can go, you know, how yeah. far I can go by realizing, oh, well, if I, if I, yeah, control is a strong word, but let's use control. If I take control yeah. of my presentation, right, it's like, it's like it's a simple thing of me sitting here so that you see my pyramids, which I shot, by the way. I, that's my picture. You did that? Uh, when I went to the pyramids. Oh, it's like, oh. you know, you only get one chance to, uh, I'm sorry, what'd you say? Bravo. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, you only get one chance to make a first impression, you know, uh, an entertainer 
obviously you present we're all presenting ourselves to other people you know our whole life whatever you're doing but an entertainer particularly is doing something that they're saying look at me when i do this thing well michael has thought that out to the nth degree i'm going to create a world of this story that i want to tell you and i want that story to appear to you the way i envision it to the nth degree yeah i mean that's what his genius is you know uh, because people kind of leave some of those uh, elements to chance of what that's going to be, you know. Yeah. Michael is thinking about and studying from all the all the greats all along. Yeah. You know, how do you create this illusion? How do you create? Oh, and I just recently found this out. I didn't even know this. I found this out from one of the fans. Michael innovated the. Uh, the device that allows him to lean a uh, smooth criminal. Yeah. You know, the thing where they lean forward yeah, the like lean. that. Yeah, for sure. Michael came up with how to do that. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you don't, you know, yeah. realize about. It's all those things that make someone great. And I found that out about a lot of people that I've worked with, right? Yeah. It's like, I went to work with James Brown and it's like during the break, you know, in rehearsal, James Brown sits down and starts playing the B3 Hammond organ. I didn't know James Brown played the organ. You know what I mean? And I found that out about many, many entertainers. They've got yeah. all these other different talents and things that, yeah. yeah, that make them, you know, when you when you meet them, you go, wow, that's why Madonna is Madonna. Or that's yeah. why, you know, yeah. Wow. I mean, it's interesting to see, you know, they have sort of multiple talents that gets them where they are. But, yeah. you know, another icon is Bubbles the Chimp. Did you ever get to meet him? <laughs> I did. As a matter of fact, I went on a date <laughs> and we went over to sing and, you know, we went over to Michael's, <laughs> to Michael's room and hung out with Bubbles, right? <laughs> How did that go down? Wow. One of the things I found out is chimps are uh, extremely more uh, strong than human beings. Yeah. So, like, you know, like his trainer was like, you know, just kind of be careful because he's strong. And I mean, when, when I grabbed his hand, I mean, he was like, I don't know, maybe three, four times stronger than I am, you know. Uh -huh. So uh, that was that was when I think about bubbles, that was the thing that kind of I didn't know. And that kind of that's my biggest impression. But he was cool to hang out with. <laughs> I bet. I bet. <laughs> so. Why do you think, you know, Michael Jackson resonates with people so, so widely? Wow. You know, the older I get, I mean, I've always loved kids, right? But the older I get, it's just more and more. I mean, I, I can be in a mood and then just see like a toddler just doing the simplest thing, just walking. This new human being experiencing the planet and those moments and just falling forward, right? Just trying to keep it going to walk. And like a yeah. toddler or little kids, they are working so hard, right? A toddler will come in and see you vacuuming the room and go, they want to help you vacuum, right? They want to work with you. Whatever you're doing, yeah. they are interested in life and things, right? Right. I see that in kids, right? I love that about kids. I remember yeah. seeing this 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 guy, I, this little kid, he was about, I was running, I was jogging, and I passed through this neighborhood. This kid was about 10, and his little sister was maybe five. And they were okay. on scooters, right? She was, of course, she's like trying to keep up with little brother. And they were on scooters, and it just hit me that kids are as serious about the next bit of fun as you are about planning this interview. You know what I mean? Like kids yeah. are absolutely serious about fun, about joy. Every kid is, as soon as they finish one thing, they're looking for the next moment of joy. How can I get the most joy out of this moment, right? Michael yeah. is in tune with that. You know what I mean? We're all that. That's what we all are. We're all looking for that next moment of joy. I don't care how old you get, and we forget, and it gets drummed out of us and everything else, but all we want is that next moment of joy, right? And we right. want to see another kid across the, uh, the, across the playground space. We want to see them having fun. 
We want to have fun and we want everybody else to be having fun. Michael is in tune with that. And he wants to channel that joy. And he does channel that joy. You think about something as simple as the moonwalk. The moonwalk is basically sliding across the floor, floor backwards, right? Yeah. Why is that exciting? Why is that why is that muscle mm. movement exciting to make people scream and pass out? Because I guarantee you, as exciting as the world, anyone in the audience thinks that is, multiply that by a thousand. And that's how excited Michael is when he's doing mm. it. Because he really gets, he's into that thing and he's, he's going, oh my God, he's making his body move a certain way. And he's feeling the excitement of that. And that's all we give to each other. We give each yeah. other our how do I feel about the words? Like how how animated I am right now. I, I'm giving that energy to you. You can't help but take that energy off of me. I'm shooting that energy to you, right? Think about what Michael is doing in a moment, right? I'm talking about something that's exciting to me, so I'm animated. How animated is he when he's moving his body backwards or doing those moves and knowing how freaking cool that looks and how cool it feels, right? And he's shooting that energy to you. He's shooting that energy out to the whole audience. Mm -hmm. And and the reason I began by talking about toddlers is because he's in tune with that. That he's in tune with that very. It's like a certain part. If you think about it, you have friends, and I have friends that can only go back to you're 16 now. I bet you have some friends that can only go back to 10 years old. Or can only even go back to 14, right? They're too cool right. to go back to three or four. Oh, right, right. And you have other friends that are like, ah, they're like the three or four year olds. In my life, I don't want to leave any of Daryl behind. I want to be the toddler Daryl. I want to be all of Daryl. Why should I leave any of that behind? I want to yeah. be all of me. And the richness of all of that juxtaposed, right? The grown-up me mixed with the toddler me, with the wisdom of the grown-up me, makes all of that a rich thing. Michael yeah. is that. And right. that is like a human being living to the fullest. Got it. That's what a Charlie Chaplin is. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like they're they're being their complete selves. And that's an it's that's an exciting thing to experience. Yeah. You know? Uh -huh. And he found this thing in an early part of his life, like I was talking about, to, to compare him to, say, Frank Sinatra. Michael found this thing at, like, five, six years old. And has been developing it, loving it, and feeding it, and feeding it, feeding it within himself. And that's just and what all we are is energy anyway. He's become this very powerful, turned-on energy, right? This yeah. aware energy, right? We're all energy. Yeah. But some of us are like they talk about being woke, right? Or, or right? Some of us are conscious of giving service, and give, and he's giving all of that beauty as service. That's his spirit. He's giving all of that out of love and wanting. He doesn't just want you to look. He wants you to feel the joy of seeing him and feeling him, and it's real. You know what I mean? It's yeah. undeniable, and you 100%. just know it. It's just, you just feel it and you know it because what comes from the gut goes to the gut. Like they say, what comes from the heart goes to the heart. He's giving yeah. out a genuine, genuine, beautiful thing. Wow, what's not to love about that, you know? Yeah. You know, I, He would be on tour. I remember being in um, Berlin. Where I was. I went to, I love, I love going to zoos. I grew up in Saint, East St. Louis and we had the St. Louis Zoo, which is one of the, I think was the, at the time I was growing up, it's like one of the third largest zoos in the world. So I loved to go to the zoo as a kid. So I would, on tour, I'd go to different, you know, whenever I travel, you know, a tour, I'd go to zoo, the zoos. So I went to Berlin Zoo and Michael's there in like a fat suit, right? <laughs> so you can't recognize him, right? Yeah. You know, going to the zoo because, you know, taking in, going to the zoo. But also, Michael would do that same thing of wearing disguises and like going to hospitals, you know, and then being a clown and juggling and doing his Michael Jackson thing for like terminally ill kids mm -hmm. and kids in the hospital. It's like, and the reason that the 
people don't know about that is because he does he's not having a reporter follow him to do that. He's doing that. Yeah. I mean, imagine this house. guy is rich, he's famous, he can do anything he wants to do. What he's choosing to do, when he did this in many cities around the world, he's going to hospitals entertaining kids, you know, because that's who he is. That's where his heart is. I mean, that's mm. that. I, that's why people love him. You know, the, the way that that yeah. comes out of him and it's all of this phenomenal entertainment that he does. Yeah. But what's coming out of him is that genuine ball of love that he is, that he wants to give out and he wants to make the world happy and joyful. Yeah, just sort of spreading it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's wow. it's it's a real thing, you know? Yeah. And we feel it. It's like, you feel it through the internet, right? You haven't even met the guy and you feel it, yeah. you know? You feel yeah. it because what we, we we talk about this in the entertainment industry, what you put into a medium is what people get out of it. So if you're joyful when you're having a recording session, that joy is coming through your voice, it's coming through what the guys are playing, that energy that you're feeding each other, that harmony that you're feeling to make that music together is all going into that recorded medium, you know? Yeah. That's energy. And then it's coming off of that to the people that are listening to it or watching yeah. it, you know? Yeah. Uh. Wow. I mean, that's such an insightful answer and a really, really unique way of putting it. But I just think mm -hmm. you're, you're so, so right there. Absolutely. I think Michael definitely, you know, had that special gift about him. And it was that, you know, just sort of transferring that energy to other people, to the audiences. You know, and it's it's universal. We all want to be that. You know what I mean? Everybody yeah. wants to be happy. Everybody would like to think that uh, they're doing something in their lives that in some way is making the world a better place. You know, and then when you see someone who's a celebrity and you genuinely feel from them, wow, this person has, they, you know, they could be doing any kind of selfish thing they want to do. They got money, they're right. We hit those. Yeah. But to see a per that kind of person then, Doing yes, what all uh -huh. of us like to do, just making, you know, putting a smile on the next person's face, you know. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's funny that you ask that is because I would be, you know, in the, in in a concert, you know, we get to heal the world, right? A man in the mirror. And that's when all the lighters go up, right? Across the whole stadium. I'm going, all of this phenomenal music that Michael makes we're like on Heal the World, right? Just simple song, right? Man in the Mirror. But that's like the whole audience is saying, we love it. We love this. We love, you know, and he has the little kids come out on stage, right? And they're just walking around a circle holding each other's hand around his globe. And they're talking about Heal the World. This almost makes me want to tear up right now. Yeah. Every now and then it happens. When I yeah, think yeah. about him. Take your time. Take your time. That's what the man was about, you know? You know, I mean, would there, would that there were more people in the world that were about that, you know? Yeah. From whatever thing that they do, you know, to offer that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so, so much, Daryl. Hmm. Before we continue with the interview, let's take a quick break to thank the sponsor of this video, Michael Jackson Market. MJ Market is a business created by passionate fans who believe that all Michael Jackson fans should have access to rare and unique collectible items at a great price. They source the items from all over the world and they provide a great buying experience. I have two of their t-shirts myself and they are really, really high quality and so I personally recommend them. They offer monthly boxes too, which are packed with fun items. For this month, they're offering a box based on Michael Jackson's Dangerous, which includes one of four t-shirt options, a cup, a poster, a bag, and some 8x10 photos, along with some other exciting surprises. So if you'd like to get some high quality Michael Jackson merchandise for yourself, head to www.michaeljacksonmarket.com and use coupon code REDJACKSON for $10 off. 
Once again, that's www.michaeljacksonmarket.com with coupon code REDJACKSON to get $10 off. So thank you once again to Michael Jackson Market for sponsoring this video. What are your general thoughts and feelings towards the upcoming Michael Jackson biographical movie? Do you think, you know, that's a good idea? And is there anything in particular you'd like them, you know, you'd like to see? What would you like audiences to see featured in the film? Huh. Um, I don't know much about the movie. I know that there's a, a play, a musical, yeah. that I've been hearing highly, you know, recommended yeah. by different friends and people that I want to go and see. Um, I think some of the things that I've talked about to you uh, about how I see Michael and what I appreciate about Michael, I would like to see the filmmaker bring out some of those aspects of him. You know, yeah. uh, from, you know, the fact that he's a humanitarian and, yeah, you know, but, but just to kind of, I, I don't know, you know, I would like to see a filmmaker, well, I guess they bring out those aspects of, of who he is, yeah. you know, and highlight those things. You know, it's, it's, it's funny, a lot of times in the news, which I don't watch because right if i go to von's market which is my su uh, supermarket near me and uh you know i help an old lady take her groceries out to the car and support and some reporters are around eh, they're not going to shoot that but that same old lady is walking out and i knock her in the head and grab her groceries that's going to be on the news yeah that's why i don't watch the news both of those things are newsworthy matter of fact the fact that you help the old person is actually more newsworthy more. why not yeah. put why not influence people with that's what the world is like, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's like, who, who knows where this element comes from that that pushes on us that what people want to see is something fearful or something the lower side of what human beings are. I don't agree with that. You know, I would like no. to see yeah. wonderful things be newsworthy, you know, and influence yeah. people to that end. So I would like to see a filmmaker, you know, tell the truth, but tell yeah. that side of the truth. You know, yeah. the, tr the truth is what 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 is what what are you looking at? What what are, where are you coming from? You know, to call what you're seeing the truth and how you string those things together. You know, I'd yeah. like to see someone string together just a, a composite of Michael that just really explores the person and and really kind of brings out, uh, you know, every film, you know, the filmmaker is manipulating you, right, to to see his mm. point of view, you know. Yeah. I would like to see the point of view be an inspiring message, you know, yeah. that I would like to see the point of view to say, see what this person, where they came from and what they made of themselves and, and why that person is what they are. What can you take from that and put into your own life and look at your own experience and how can you benefit from that? You know, yeah, how can so you draw of, from that and go, this is how I can be better. This is how I can, you know. Yeah, like inspiring other people through that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah, that's really sort of, that's really respectable. And yeah, definitely mm -hmm. sort of feeding into what Michael's whole message was, you know, with yeah. positivity. Like Man in the Mirror, the whole sort of message yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's move on to discuss some of your current work now. So I've heard that you've been working on your solo EP. Is that something, you know, you've always sort of wanted to work on? Or was that more of like a later decision for you? Oh, no, always, you know, but what happens is life gets in the way. It's like, how do I turn yeah. down going on tour with Michael Jackson or going on tour with Lionel yeah. Richie or going to the studio, you know, oh, it's another studio day, 45 minutes, but you might make $10,000, you know, it's like, and then you yeah. come home at the end of the day kind of tired, you know, because I mean, at one point, I mean, I'd be doing as many as four sessions a day, you know, something on movies, something on television thing, a couple of records, you know. Yeah. So, um, yes, and, and I have produced things of my own along the way, but um, 
so yes, it's something I've always aspired to do. That's why I have a studio and that's why. I've, and there are things that I've done that are my own creative things that, you know, that people don't necessarily know in the media in a big way. And then certain things are you know, like Frazier and, but, um, yeah. um, Yes. So right now, my um, my EP is called The Dream because that's the center. Uh, it's one of the central songs. And basically that came that that whole idea came out from an actual dream that I had that song. I dreamed and this is these are the beginning of the lyrics. I dreamed I was having a dream in which I wake up still in the dream. Which means I was still in the dream. I was still in the dream of the dream I dreamed in the dreaming state. Dreaming that I'm asleep, dreaming, dreaming of having a dream in which I wake up still in the dream that I can't wake up from the dreaming state. Have you ever done that? Have you ever woke up, thought you had woke up, and then later you actually wake up and you were like, wait a minute, I yeah. hadn't wake I was still dreaming, but I dreamed I yeah. was awake. It's a lot of dreaming. Wow. But yeah, you know, I know so, what you mean. So so I've, I've read some books on dreaming in the past, creative dreaming, lucid dreaming. And so I want to speak specifically about lucid dreaming. Yeah. Lucid dreaming means training your, teaching yourself. A lucid dream is a dream which you are awake in the dream. And so you're control, you can control the dream. And so mm -hmm. this book I was reading is, teaches you how to do that. How to, how to become awake in your dream and realize you're dreaming and then to like control the dream. And, and by doing so, the practical reason for wanting to do that is if you start to do it in your dreams, you're building that same faculty to do it in your real life, right? To make okay. choices of being lucid in your life and making, you know, uh, choices that make your life what you want it to be. Yeah. So the way, and the way you train yourself to have a lucid dream it's like right now, look around the room where you are. I'm going to do the same thing and see if anything about what's going on right now doesn't seem right. Does everything kind of seem in order? Mm, I think so. I think so. Things okay, good. it does to me. It does to me. Okay, now imagine doing that four or five times a day, right? Training your mind to do that. So tonight when you're dreaming, right? Or maybe a week from now when you're dreaming, you've been training five times a day. You've been kind of just take a, you know, 10 seconds, look around the room and see if anything's out of order. You're training yourself that when you're dreaming, you're going to look around because dreams feel like they're as real as this, right? Mm. When I'm dreaming, it seems as real as this is right now. Yeah. What's going to happen is you're going to look around the room and go, wait a minute. That toaster, it isn't, that's, that's in my living room. Why is that in the bedroom? Oh my God, this is a dream. That's how you train yourself to find, to, to, to be lucid in a dream. By seeing what's out of place and then realizing you're dreaming. And then, okay, if this is a dream. Okay, then I don't have to be running from that thing or I can stop. I, you know, you can start making conscious choices in the dream, which okay. are then teaching you actually to do that in your real life as well. Right. And who's to say this isn't a dream of the energy that we really are, the, the entities that we really are. Who's to say that life on the planet Earth in a three-dimensional space-time continuum mm -hmm. is not a dream, right? That we're playing right. as these beings that we really are, except it's yeah. a more interactive dream, you know, more fun dream. And, and of course, you wouldn't make yourself aware that it's a dream because that takes the fun out of it. You know, anyway, yeah. so that's what the song, The Dream is about. Right. Yeah. And about thinking of if this is a dream, then let me take control of it more. Let me make some of those yeah. decisions. Let me conquer some more of my fear in this dream, things mm. that I'm afraid of. Let me let me push the envelope on something I'm afraid of, you know? Yeah, I like that sort of. It takes, you know, a really sort of interesting idea. And yeah, mm. I think that'll be interesting in, in song form. Do you have any sort of like idea as to when everything will be complete? Or are you just sort of going with the what flow? Well, I'm looking for, for uh, April, April for to come out with. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. You have to keep in touch so All I can, right. you know, send everything to the viewers. 
Yeah, and I will. So you've had such a wonderful and sort of diverse career. Did you did you ever envisage that you'd end up where you are now, you know, right at the beginning of your career? Are you somebody who sort of planned your career path out and sort of was determined to follow it? Or did you sort of go with the flow a bit more? Because you must be, you know, so proud of, you know, how things have gone. Well, I think, it, I, I think, I mean, I had a plan. I mean, I wanted to come out here and be like, you know, a recording artist and, and an actor, you yeah. know? Uh, I've done some of both of those things, but then life comes in there in different ways. I mean, one of the things I wanted to do was travel around the world performing. You know, and wow, I've gotten to do that in the biggest way possible, right? So I think I think that we, this is my own feeling and theory. I think we are creating our own, we're co-creators of our own reality with the all that is. And I think to the extent that you believe something, you're bringing that thing to to fruition, uh, I'll say it in two ways. To the extent that you believe something and you emotionally invest in that thing. For instance, if you're afraid of something that's believing in it, your body and your emotions are believing that fearful thing and you're bringing that thing about. And I think a large majority of what uh, the average person is bringing about in their daily life is a whole lot of stuff they're, they're fearful of on, on all the different levels of fear. And think about, again, if I help the old lady with her mm -hmm. groceries, that's not going to be on the news. If I hit her in the head and run off with a bag, that's going to be on the news. The news is full of fearful stuff, right? It's like yeah. we're being controlled by a bunch of fear. You know, I think that's the only thing that we really, I think the ultimate thing to overcome is fear. You know, no. So I think to the extent that you that I have overcome fear in my life and have followed through on visualizing and having intentions for things. And as time has gone on, I've been more open and just visualizing the sketch of it and allowing God or the all that is or the universe to fill in, right? Because sometimes yeah. it's better than what you can come up with, right? Yeah. So I'm hoping yeah, yeah. for it to be what I want it to be or better, right? Yeah. And some of that or, or, or better is like, whoa, I'm singing Jermaine in high school. I'm singing Jermaine's you know, I, uh, what was it? Uh, I'm singing Jermaine's uh, I Found That Girl and I'm now on tour singing I'll Be There at Jermaine's Party with Michael J. You know, that's, I wouldn't have dreamed that yeah. up, you know? So I'm mm -hmm. hoping to uh, having a sketch, you know, of what I want and moving forward, you know, I know that I want to sing, I want to travel, I want to create things. I want to put some of my ideas into the world through art. And I'm open to how that will shape itself, you know? Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. You must be, you know, so proud of what you've accomplished, but also, you know, sort of excited to keep moving forward with it. And hmm. it's interesting what you said about doing acting work too. So did it sort of take a while for you to sort of find that career of choice specifically? Or was that more of like, something you just sort of branched off with or you know how did that whole thing work you say career of choice being what are you calling my career of choice you know mainly in the music industry ever since i was a kid i uh listening to the radio and mimicking the voices of people on the radio i knew that i could sing as a matter of fact whether i was this is my illusion or not i was singing as good as them you know, to yeah. myself. So I was like, yeah. oh, well, I can, I want to do that. I can do that. You can I can do love that. It. Yeah. You know, and people responded at it from very early on when I started to perform. I was always getting excellent response, you know. So, uh, yeah, I've always wanted to be an entertainer. Yeah. And to act and to sing, you know. I think writing came later, you know. Okay. Um, Yeah, I was more into singing when I think about when I was younger. I was more thinking about singing than I was writing what I was going to sing, even yeah. though I was writing some other little stories. But I didn't connect that to 
like for instance, Stevie Wonder has always wrote his own songs and sung his own songs. Prince has always wrote his, you know what I mean? It's like they, those two came together for them. You yeah. know what I mean? So, um, and it's not yeah. like I didn't, I didn't have any doubt. Oh, I don't know if I know how to write. It just wasn't, I wasn't fired up about that. Like I was just about learning how to make the sounds and, and make yeah. those sounds. I wanted to have control of my voice in order to make my voice sound like what I heard in my head, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I get what you mean, yeah. But I mean, you sort of got to use that acting experience as well with This Is It. Well, with all the world tours, really. We got yeah. to sort of play characters and use props and costumes, etc. Yeah. You know, and I've been, a, I've, you know, I did a, a television show called Cop Rock. It was a musical. It was on for one season. And actually, the scene that I was in in Cop Rock, the show kind of got, uh, planned a little bit by the um, what do you call them the um, the people who critique oh critics oh right? the critics yeah but the particular scene uh, literally the particular scene that I did uh, was hailed when they said you know when it's bad it's really bad and they mm -hmm. talked about you know a couple like a police officer that had a strong character but then when he opened his mouth to sing it's like all of a sudden he's weak. And they say, but when, and that's when it's bad, it's really bad. Or, you know, the fact that they're trying to put too many songs in the show, you know, but they say, but when it's good, it's really good. And they cited the scene that I was in, you know, uh, about they said, uh, yeah. a guy, a, a, a couple, a poor couple, you know, and the husband is a, like an alcoholic, uh, things to comfort each other in it's each other's arms. You know, he talked about my scene, so. That was a that was in TV yeah. guide. So, and you know, and I and I also acted in, in college. So you know, I've had, I guess in the end, there's my problem from my point of view is there's only so much time to choose what it is you're going to do and to go into it. I think that I could have had a career as an actor as well as a as a career as an artist. Mm. Um, now that I've kind of lived it, I think that it's much more fun to go on tour with Michael Jackson and all the, and all the weight is on him. And I'm yeah. having like, my part was easy to me. Right. Yeah. So I can see how I can definitely see how different artists, you know, because in the beginning artists are sensitive people, they're people who are open and vulnerable. That's how they kind of tap into, you know, their, their talents and gifts. I think yeah. a lot of that people become alcoholics or taking drugs mm. is because, you know, the world is what it is. And those people take it very, you know, personally, you know, I know that I take things very personally. Yeah. And so I think very possibly, you know, a life of being on this and then, you know, you, you become an artist and all of a sudden you're a target. You know, it's like, whoa, I'm not doing, you know, I'm doing, I'm trying to yeah. share something to feel good about. Next thing you know, there's these whole people who make their career off of like, taking pot shots at you, you know? Yeah. So I think not having been an artist has spared me that. I don't know how I yeah. would have fared through that, you know? Yeah. Um, That's fair enough. Yeah. Hmm. And so to wrap things up, you know, looking back over your career, is there anything that you've learned along the way that you can sort of pass on as advice for people aspiring, you know, either to be in the music industry or as artists or just life in general, anything like that? You know, I think it's some of the things that I'm going to, you know, talk about on my EP, mm. like the idea that we use life, the metaphor of life being a dream. Why not make it a lucid dream, right? A lucid dream. Just like we're talking about, they talk about being woke right now, by right? you know, being conscious, being aware. It's like, why not make your life be on purpose, mm. right? The time is going to pass anyway. If there's some yeah. skill you want to develop, three years from now, you will have not done it or done it. Three years from now, it's still going to come. So are you going to be the person that three years from now didn't do it and feel resentful or regretting? Or are you going to be the person yeah. that did it, you know? make the conscious choice, live life on purpose. 
you know, the biggest thing we have to conquer is fear. And you know, and, and you've heard the saying, uh, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. You know. Yeah. Fear is kind of like this illusory thing that stops us in all kinds of ways, right? In your own life, your fears are really kind of daunting to you, but you can look at someone else's fears and see how th that aren't your fears, right? And go, wow, if they could just see past that, they could do this or that and the other. Imagine that for yourself. For if yourself. you could just see past yours in that way, you could do this or the other. So I say, if I'm gonna wake up every morning, why am I waking up? Why am I waking up tomorrow? Mm. If not to do what is in my heart and to move forward with whatever vision that I have of the thing that I want to do. And even if I don't have a strong vision of what I want to do, why not meditate or pray or whatever you feel that is, ask the universe for what that is that you are. Mm. You know, that would be your vision. I think everything in nature is made for a purpose. A cactus is not an elephant, is not uh, a banana. You know, each thing in nature has a unique thing to do. You know, yeah. we, all of these uh, relationships are symbiotic. Plants give off oxygen. We're breathing out carbon dioxide. There is a purpose for you to be specifically who and what you are. What yeah. would be more important than finding out what that is and moving forward with that? It's going to you're going to give the most service to the world by being happy and ex excited about what it is that you're doing, you know, and you're going to create the most exciting and, and, and joyful life that you can possibly create for yourself. Yeah. You know, so I say. Find that thing, how, whatever, however much time it takes. You got something better to do? Find that thing that makes you excited and put your energy and your focus and your space and your time into that thing. Because if yeah. you don't, you'll be doing that in someone else's life. You'll be doing what they found is their thing that they're excited about and then they enlist you to be a part of theirs, right? So Got it. find what is yours. And that's going to be a part of somebody's and part of other human beings anyway, right? But yeah, find the thing that excites you and what makes you want to get up in the morning, you know? Yeah, that's really, really, really good advice there. I like that mm -hmm. a lot. Really sort of good way to live, making the most of, you know, every moment. And I say that we're creating our own reality, you know? And, mm -hmm. and to the people that think, ah, oh, that sounds kind of airy-fairy, I would say this. Take two twins. One believes that they're creating their own reality. And so they're following, like, okay, I'm excited about this. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try this. I'm gonna try. The other twin thinks that life is kind of, you know, willy-nilly. Anything can happen anytime. You might get hit by a car. Just, wow, the normal way that people live, right? Both one of you know, so take both of those twins. When they go to an interview, which one of them do you think is going to get the job? Just from yeah. the attitude that one has, which one of them is going to have more friends and people wanting to be around them? At, at the end of 80 years of life, which one of those twins, I use twins because they're biologically the same, right? Which one of those twins do you think will have had the most enjoyable life? The one that yeah. kind of believes, hey, I'm creating my own reality and I can, you know, and I can shape it the way I want, whether it's a fantasy or not. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. all a fantasy. Why, if, if it's a fantasy, why would I want to imagine negative things? If, yeah. I'm, if my reality is what I'm imagining anyway, right? It's, yeah. here's, the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the acid test. What kind of day is today? Today a good day or a bad day? It's the day you think it is. Once I figured that yeah. out, dude, they're all good days, Red. <laughs> Why would I have another bad day when I realize I'm the one, you know, that doesn't depend upon you believing in anything outside of yourself, anything magical, mystical. It's just simply, is it a good day or not? It's the one you think it is. And it's going to be, so it's, our imaginations are so powerful. Mm. That's the difference between us and, and other, you know, species. We have imagination. It's the most powerful tool that we have. The world is the world that you see. 
and that can help us succeed and live like a richer life. Yeah. You know. That's yeah, such great advice there. So thank you so, so, so much for your time today, Daryl. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. And I've really, really enjoyed, you know, such an insightful conversation today. Well, I'm glad. And it was, it was a pleasure talking to you, R-E-D. <laughs> Before we go, do we have any, like, social media or anything coming up that you'd like to promote to the viewers? Anything you want to mention? Um, well, I'm putting together my, my Facebook, I mean, not my, my Facebook, my, uh, my website now. I'm ashamed to say okay. I don't have, but, you know, I'm putting to get together now. And so maybe I'll chime back to you when I have my uh, when I'm when I have my website absolutely uh, you know and my EP coming up and I'll let you know yeah. and you can share that absolutely yeah. will do well thank you so so much once again and I hope you have a great rest of your day I'll keep in touch and I can't wait for all my viewers to see this all right so I just hope I haven't talked too much <laughs> 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 Not at all. It's been, you know, it's been such a blast and it's gone really quickly. I don't know about you. <laughs> Time is an illusion, you know. Everything is an illusion. All the dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have all a right, good one. Ray, it's been a pleasure talking to you.